Oh, um, I was just uh, contemplating and meditating upon the, uh, the, the sacred uh, secrets of the dividend. No, I was, no, I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm just uh, being silly. Um, let's continue with the last presentation in Chapter 6 and a continuation of our discussion of the dividend discount models with the best, the absolute best dividend discount model, in my humble opinion. And the very cool thing about this technique, this calculation that we are going to do, is that this can be used for any type of investment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we'll take a quick uh, detour uh, later that that um, you'll see that you can look at this model and use it for virtually any type of investment that you are contemplating but first we're going to use it for stocks okay so let's get started on slide 35 the discounted cash flow model uses the present value of expected dividends and the present value of the expected future price of the share of stock to value the share of stock so so the formula is very simple and very similar to the pure form of the dividend discount model that we first looked at at the beginning of the previous presentation do, do you remember the first example with the three dividends, three yearly dividends, and then the company uh, subsequently went out of business, <laughs> which we said is pretty ridiculous? Yeah, well, we're going to do exactly that, but we're going to assume that the company doesn't go out of business. We're going to take a look at what we believe the value of the price of the stock will be after three or four years. So the formula becomes... The present value of the future dividends, which we've already done and will review, don't worry, plus the present value of the price of the stock when we plan to sell in three, four years or so. We use the present value multipliers from the table. If you really want to do the exponential formula, spreadsheet makes it easy. Go right ahead. It's a pity that it's not covered specifically in our text. I guess it's just implied. But if I were to <laughs> ask the authors to do anything to their task, text, I would say at least show one example like this. As with the other dividend discount models that we took a look at, this model is very sensitive to our estimates and our choice of required rate of return, and hence can be very far off the mark, or should we say will be very far off the mark. Because, as we've said over and over again, we are not assuming, we are not believing that these numbers are going to be anything uh, close to the, to the reality in, in, the, in the future. But, in fact, we can pretty much assume that our predictions will be way off the mark. So, uh, why are we doing them? <laughs> well, it's very simple. We are doing them to identify potentially good uh, investments for us, and we are tilting the odds. As I've said on, as we've said on many occasions, we're tilting the odds in our favor, because if we follow these techniques, we're going to be investing in companies that have long track records, that have the roots deep in the economy. Those are going to make up the bulk of our investments. Sure, every once in a while we're going to buy a speculative issue, as uh, Benjamin Graham would say. But for the most part, we're going to invest in companies that are the stalwarts, as um, Peter Lynch calls them. So let's continue with the best, the greatest, in my humble opinion, model and that's the discounted cash flow model slide 36 here's an example let's assume it's january 1st 2017 pretzels unlimited 
symbol PU, <laughs> is currently selling for $22 per share. And they're paying two bucks per share in dividends in 2017. Now we expect them, or they say, or or, or someone else tells us that that they will increase their dividends to two dollars and twenty cents in 2018, two dollars and thirty cents in 2019, and two thousand and thirty cents in 2020. And we're thinking that we're going to be selling the stock at the end of 2020. We expect the price to be. $27 per share at that time. Okay? All right? Our required rate of return, what we're looking for is 12%. Uh, okay, all right. So it's a little high. It's higher than I normally check, but let's say 12%. Now, here's how it works the value of the stock is equal to the present value of the future dividends plus the present value of the price of the stock when we plan to sell. So really, this is that 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 original um, form of the dividend discount model that we looked at in the previous presentation. But in this case, we're using the present value of the future dividend. So we're using the, the cash flow from the dividends. Plus, we're looking at the price of the stock as a future cash flow, which is indeed what it would be, because when you sell it, you get the cash. So how do we do this? Well, you could use the formula with the the exponentiation, but don't bother. Use the table. And this time we're going to take a look at the table. $2 is the cash flow we're going to get in 2017. $2.20 in 2018. $2.20 and 30 cents in 2019. And then two dollars 2000 I'm sorry, $2.30 in 2020 plus $27 in 2020. So we're going to get $2 in 2017. Let's, let's do that again, make sure I, 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 I didn't confuse you too much. In 2018, $2.20. $2.30 in 2019. $2.30 in 2020 from the dividends. And then again, $27 in 2020 from the sale of the stock. And so how do we discount that? That's the verb they use in the industry, discount it. How do we bring it back to the present? Well, you could use those formulas with the exponentiation, but we mortals use the, port, the, the present value tables. And so let's, let's run over to the present value table. Remember I asked you to print it out or have it on your screen if you have a big screen. And here it is. And we go across the 12%. There's 12%. You see it? And we go down one year, two years, three years, four years, and we find that these are the present value multipliers, the PVMs. So if we go back, the present value multiplier for year number one at 12% is 0 0.893. And that's exactly what we have here. We're taking that $2 and we're multiplying it times 0 0.893. And that tells us that that $2 a year from now is worth one dollar seventy eight point six cents you know almost a, almost a dollar seventy nine and then the second year go back to the table zero point seven nine seven you see that it's easy folks it really is once you do it a few times it's just plugging the numbers in so we multiply the two dollars and twenty cents we're going to get in 2018 by zero point seven nine seven and that's worth to us $1.75, a little bit more than $1.75. $2.30 is equal, is multiplied times the present value multiplier for three years, 0 0.712. And that $2.30 times 0 0.712 is equal to almost $1.64. And then the $2.30 we're going to get in 2020 is multiplied by the present value multiplier for year number four. 0.636. Okay, what's that? $2.30 times 0.636 is $1.46, a little bit more. And then because we're going to get the $27 from the sale of the stock in, in 2020, we use the same present value multiplier. Don't go to year number five. We're not waiting another year to sell the stock. We're selling the stock or we're assuming we will sell the stock in, um, in, the, in 2020. So we use the same present value multiplier. A little tricky. Don't get don't get confused. 
And so that's 27 times 0.636, or a little over $17.17. You add those all up together, and you get $23.81. The market is offering us this stock for 22 bucks. So we believe, hey, this is a pretty good prospect. This is something for us to, to investigate. Because we're buying $23.81 of stock for only $22. Now, again, as we said, <laughs> it's probably not going to be $27 bucks in, in four years. We don't know that we're going to get these dividends. But if it's a company that's been paying dividends for 40 years, 80 years, yeah, that's, yeah, it's a good sign. Okay? Now, those calculations are pretty straightforward. Do them enough times. But what if we rearrange them? Let's rearrange it into a table, which for me makes it much easier to, to see what we're doing. We put the years on the left-hand side and then put the cash flows from the dividends, the present value multiplier, that's what PVM at 12%, and you can either put it above there or below there, and then the discounted cash flows. You see that verb, there's that word again, and I know it, it might confuse you, but you should say it a few times because it, it, it's what we're doing. We're discounting these future cash flows, $2, $2.20, $2.30, $2.30, and $27, and we're turning them into the present value of those future cash flows, or as we say, discounted cash flows. That's why the model is called the discounted cash flow model. And I think it is much easier to comprehend and calculate, right? Don't you think so? Well, watch this. Watch this. We're going to now take the two calculations in 2020, and we're going to put them together. And that reduces the number of calculations we have to make. It, 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 it saves us a, a, a couple of, of um, multiplications and additions. But more importantly, by taking the $2.30 in dividends and the $27 in the, what the expected price of the stock and putting them together in a single cell in our spreadsheet, it allows us to use a special spreadsheet function. Yes, it's, see, you know, you, you're a people who have gone before you, dear students. <laughs> and it allows us to do internal rate of return. Slide number 39. The internal rate of return is a measure of what the rate of return we expect to get from a series of cash flows is. It's, it, it's what we expect if we get the cash flows we think we're going to get. Now, it includes not only the positive. See, in our calculations, we just did the positive cash flows. But you also have to include the negative cash flows. What is What, what are we talking about, Pino? In other words, we had to pay $22 for the stock. That was money that went out of our pockets. So that has to go into the calculation. Someday, dear students, when you take an upper level or a graduate finance or investment class, you will learn how to manually compute internal rate of return, and hopefully you will not have a sadistic professor who will require you to do it more than once because it's a pain in the It's not that hard. It's just a pain in the neck. That's why we have computers. We are simply going to enter the numbers into a spreadsheet formula and press the enter key, okay? Yeah. In other words, we required a 12% rate of return from Pretzels Unlimited. But what do our expected numbers tell us we are actually going to get? What should be our expected rate of return, assuming that we get the cash flows we, we think we're going to get? Well, here is the spreadsheet again, but notice we have to add. We have to add times zero. That's why it's empty right now. Right now, we have to add the $22 as a negative number. Now, you put a negative 22, and then the spreadsheet shows it in parentheses, and that's how we, in business and accounting, we show negative numbers with a, with a uh, uh, parentheses. So the initial outlay is 22 bucks. You got it? Right. And so you uh, enter any outflows as negative numbers, and then you enter the cash inflows as positive numbers. And what you do is you, you then have a 
you know, it, it, if you've worked with spreadsheets, this is going to be pretty easy. If you haven't, you really should learn. You should take the biz, the CIS 122B it is, or take CIS 101, or just bang away on um, LibreOffice or OpenOffice or Google Docs or Expel. I'm sorry, excuse. I'm sorry, Excel, right, Excel. And until you can create a formula and, and realizing that you, you're only going to use, you know, Two or three or five percent of the spreadsheets capabilities but that's okay we, we we need to do this we we're going to do it and of course there are spreadsheets on the website for you to use but you you start from this cell you end from this cell and let's say this was a column a column b and this was row one row two row three row four row, row five so the formula in this cell right here is Equal sign, because in Excel you have to start all formulas with equal sign. IRR, which stands for Internal Rate of Return. Open parentheses B2 through B5. And then what did I put here? 12%. Well, that's your guess, right? That's your approximation. The computer is then going to take that guess, and you can leave it zero. You can leave it zero and let the computer try its best to figure it out. It's going to take that guess, and then it's going to find, if it does, it might come up error because sometimes you can't find the internal rate of return. And that's that's you know, that's how we, in the advanced uh, investment class at the university, it will teach you why. I'm not going to teach you. Maybe, maybe later on. But uh, it's not that it's not that important. Normally, you will if it's a bona fide investment, unless you put some really screwy numbers in. It's going to find the internal rate of return. Okay, you, you with me? You understand? So it went in and said, "Wait, if you pay what you said you're going to pay, twenty two bucks, and you get these dividends, and you get the price, the price of the stock is twenty seven dollars. You can sell for twenty seven. You're really going to get fourteen and a half percent out of this investment." You understand? So the, the so the spreadsheet, the internal rate of return is telling us if if what you say is going to happen, boss, right? If if the if the if the cash flows come in as you expect them, you're going to get fifteen and a half percent from this stock. Pretty cool, yeah. It is. It is. This is very cool, folks. And of course, in the face to face class, we would now run on over to the spreadsheet that's on the class web page. You can do that now. It's up to you, or you can wait until later and see that we've typed in all these numbers and we've typed in the formula, and bingo, it gave us that internal rate of return. And also, our formula does calculate the present value. The, the, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the spreadsheet calculates the, the present value. What the formulas in the spreadsheet calculate the present value. So, as we said, it, from the beginning of this chapter. The calculations are a lot easier than the concepts. Because when someone says you're gonna you're gonna discount a future stream of cash flows, you go, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> and then when you do it a few times you go, oh, I just type in the numbers and the and the spreadsheet tells me what it's worth. Now it tells me what that future values that I get in the future is worth to me today. That's that's all the, the calculations are doing. But we use this terminology to make us sound really, really important. And you can't understand this because you're a pure a peon and we're a very smart investment. No, it's not that hard, folks. It's not that hard. And the very cool thing about internal rate of return and your spreadsheet is that you can take any investment any investment, real estate, or a a factory or a business that's producing income, or or um, um, a bond, which we're going to we're going to learn how to do it with bonds, and we get the bonds. Any investment that throws off a cash flow, and has to have you know money put in, resources that we put in. Remember the definition of our investment, the definition of of an investment. Any instrument where we put resources in that we expect to get a cash flow from or the value to increase or both. And, and so this is very, very cool. So I, I'm going to throw this at you time and time again. We're going to do lots of these. Right. The worksheet, the, 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 the work, both worksheets, the assignment and the exam, they're going to look all the same, folks. 
they're going to be in the exact same order. Right? The, uh, the, uh, the, 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 first will be the price models. Then will be the, uh, the, 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 the zero growth model for the dividend discount. And then the constant perpetual. Then will be the discounted cash flows. Yes. In fact, in fact, dear students, slide 41. So far, we have looked at models that only work if we get dividends. Well, yeah, that's why they're called dividend discount models. But what about a company that pays no dividends? Huh? Can we use this model? Yes. Example number two, Jeans R Us, is currently selling for $21 a share. It pays no dividends. Why? Because it's one of these biotech startups that I'm all, I used to be, used to be a big sucker for. <laughs> we believe that Jeans or Us will sell for around 50 bucks in five years. And they're not paying any dividends and, and they're working on this drug and it could be a huge blockbuster, but they have to put out 600, 700 million dollars to get the drug, drug through the pipeline. But then in five years, oh boy, the stock's going to skyrocket. Our required rate of return is 13%. Well, how can we determine if this is a good investment? Well, <laughs> with no dividends, the future value of zero is zero, right? If you're not bringing in any dividends, then the, the, the I'm sorry, the present value, I say future, I said future value, my apologies. The present value of zero dollars coming in from dividends is equal to zero. So that's why we see on the left-hand side of the formula, no dividends, zero, right? But we believe that the stock is going to be 50 bucks in five years, right? And so we use the same uh, technique. We go across, I'm going to go back to the table now, to 13%, our required rate of return, and go down five years, and the present value multiplier is 0.543. So let's return to the presentation and we multiply the $50 times the, the present value multiplier and we find that the stock today is worth $27.13 according to our estimates. Right. <laughs> you get the feeling? <laughs> exactly. This is a very speculative investment. It's paying no dividends and it's not probably earning any money and who knows what the price is going to be in five years. It could be 50 bucks. It could be 50 cents. And I go back to that wonderful quote by Mr. Graham that unless after thorough analysis our potential investment does not guarantee us a decent rate of return with safety, then the investment is speculative. And so, do you want to have genes or us in your portfolio? Maybe, you know, maybe. But realizing that this should be the spice, this should be the, the, the Vegas part of your portfolio which I and I used to call my fund my little fund that I bought the high-tech biotech companies I called it my Vegas fund and it learned it lived down to its name dear students yes it did it did it live down to its name uh, yeah and so 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 does it mean you shouldn't buy a company like this no I'm not saying you shouldn't but these should be the the exception to the rule and more importantly, at least you will have your eyes wide open. This ain't a 3M. This ain't a General Electric, right? This is not a stalwart, as Peter Lynch calls them, a blue chip company. This is a gamble. This is a speculation. And it might turn out for you. It, it may turn out well for you. It didn't turn out well for me, but it may turn out well for you. So at least you will have your eyes wide open. And when it does crash and burn, you'll go, well, Piano told me. 
But if it zooms ahead and it funds your child's ed college education or that dream vacation to uh, Tahiti or just makes you very wealthy, you can come back and play on a <laughs> slide 42. There are other valuation models. There are many others. In chapter 6, they use the residual income model, which is basically the same idea, except it's using income. And then the free cash flow model is the residual income model taken one step further to take into the account that some expense items are non-cash, right, like depreciation. But, you know, it's the same idea, folks. So we'll skip these for now, maybe come back to them later, but I think you have enough on your plate, right? And so what I want you to do now, I mean, you can do it now, but, but or right after the presentation, is go back to the worksheet number one, and you will see problems that are, hint, 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 very similar to the ones in the presentation, and worksheet number two, and then the assignment, and maybe on the exam, and they will be in the exact same order. So not meant to confuse you. Uh-huh, all right. <laughs> Great. Slide 43. Okay. Okay, Piano. This is all great. This is great. You know, it's an academic exercise. But just where are we supposed to get all this historical information anyway? And just who decides what next year's earnings per share, sales per share, cash flow per share, dividends per share, etc., etc., are going to be, let alone the expected price of a stock in three to five years? Hmm? Well, before the internet, should we start saying BI, before the internet? This information was not readily available. Normally, you would ask your broker for it, and if you had a good relationship with your broker, they would uh, sit down with you and, and show you what they believed, because they have their own, the, the major brokerage firms had their own research departments. Or you would use one of the securities industry's trusted information sources. And traditionally, my dear students, the most respected source, and still the most respected source in my humble opinion, is the value line. Slide 44. Still one of the most respected and trusted sources of data and analysis. Traditionally, it was often the only source that many investors used for data and analysis, along with the company's materials, you know, the annual report and the quarterly reports. It's not cheap. It is not cheap. It's 50 bucks a month, $600 a year. But you can get it for free at the at the libraries, at, the, at various libraries. Not all libraries have it. Southwestern got rid of it a few years ago when we went through that near-death experience. But <clears throat> this is what I do for fun. Okay, it sounds like you might want to know a little bit of a, a trivial knowledge about your humble professor. My wife is very much a reader of historical novels so on a Sunday afternoon or some other afternoon we'll go to the library together and she'll sift through historical novels and you know, take home four or five of them and voraciously read them and I'll get lost in the value line because it is enormous it, it is they do the, the, the one you'll normally see is the the value line um, I forget the name of it, but it's the it's the it's the the, the traditional one. It's twenty seven hundred stocks, and then they have one that does small and medium sized companies, and they have a subset that's six hundred. But yeah, the six hundred are enough. But the twenty seven hundred one is normally the one you'll see at the library, and and it's just <laughs> it's my idea of a great time. Hmm, okay. I'm a big fan of Value Line, especially their timeliness and safety indicators. One study which ignored the transaction costs and the tax consequences only used their timeliness indicator. It showed how you would have beaten the market handsomely over a 20 year period by simply buying stocks when they received their, num their number one timeliness and selling them when they lost their num number one timeliness. Now I'm not suggesting you do this. It's just it just shows that they're, they're pretty good. You know, they're, they're not infallible, folks, as we'll see, but they're pretty good. And <clears throat> in your book, in the sixth edition, 
they use McGraw Hill and they use that in the fifth and the fourth and the third and that's why I'm going to stick with that copy that's from the sixth edition the seventh edition they switched to Procter and Gamble and I know why they did that it's because McGraw Hill basically split itself up into Standard and Poor's and then the other part with with all the you know the 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 television stations and the radio stations and the 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 um, magazines and the like so McGraw Hill is basically no more and I'm sorry and the textbooks textbook split off because that's a very very big winner for them but they see the writing on the wall they see that you know more and more <laughs> like yours truly are having the students use third and fourth editions when they're up to seventh edition and getting it on the internet for ten dollars instead of going to the college bookstore and buying it for seven hundred dollars <laughs> I, I am a bit of a over exaggeration I think they want two hundred eighty five dollars for this book now it ain't worth it folks so look at all this information folks look at it the indicators the pr price future price projections the historical data the cash assets receivables inventory other assets the description analysis of the business the historical annual rates the insider institutional buying and selling the amount of debt the number of shares the company's financial strength stability price growth earnings predictability ratings <gasps> it's a sip from the fire hose it's one page chock full of information but here's the best part. This is the most exciting part, folks. Look, this is, um, what is this? This is uh, 2009 from the 6th edition. What they do is they show you what they believe the next three to four to five years is in store. Because that's about as far as you dare look into the future. And if you remember, back in when we were looking at mutual funds, and I said to you, I like a mutual fund, a, a, a um, active, an actively managed mutual fund that has about a 20 to 25 percent turnover. Why? Because that means they're thinking three, four, five years ahead. Right? They're not looking at what the next quarter is going to bring, or the next month, or the next 10 microseconds. They're looking at the company in three, four, five years. And they're thinking, what's the sales per share going to be in three, four, five years? The cash flow per share, the earnings per share, the dividends, and and the price, right? <laughs> do, do you see? Do you see? I I hope so. I mean, obviously, if you're looking at this on your on your um, cell phone or tablet, you can't read what's on the screen. But but you're going to go to your book or go to the library and check out the value. Now, you can't take it out of the library. It's a reference material. But you <clears throat> are not supposed to make copies, but they don't mind if you make one or two copies to take home with you of, of certain companies that you're very interested in. Uh, value Line wouldn't be too happy about that, but people do it. and Or just do all your research there. Yeah, it's amazing. And then the bottom part has um, the their uh, analysis, and you know they're they're it's it's not that long, but 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 it's 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 pretty co uh, it's pretty uh, uh, what's the word cogent. <laughs> it's it's it, it it does a very good job of describing it. Now you're going to want to do more research than just what's on here, but these guys are pretty good, folks. Here's Remember the past five years, sales per share growth and earnings per share growth and what they believe is going to be uh, in the next few years, right? The next year, exactly, 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 exactly. Slide 48. Let's put value line to the test. Hmm? In late 2009, the price of McGraw Hill was $28.73, and their price prediction for early 2013 was in the range from $48 to $68. And on February 15, 2013, McGraw Hill's price closed at $45, bucks, $44.95. Not too bad, huh? That's pretty good. Pretty good. When they made this prediction, folks, at the end of 2009, the stock market had rallied 
from the depths of the 2008-2009 crisis. But many people were still predicting the end of the world. I don't know if you remember it, you know, it's just, you know seven, eight years ago, but, but it, 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 was, it was bad, folks. People were, 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 millions of people had lost their job, five million people or so. A Mill, couple million, well, not quite. We don't really know how many, but, but, but hundreds of thousands of people, well over a million probably lost their homes. Some are still predicting the end of the world, and you will always hear predictions of the end of the world, and someday they're going to be right, but we don't know when. Let's take a look at the predictions from the fourth edition. Here's the fourth edition, which in 2005 said in 2008 and 9 it was going to be 64 to 54 to 90 bucks. Yippee, yippee. Uh oh. <laughs> Their price prediction for late 2009 was in the range from around 66 bucks to around 82 dollars, but McGraw Hill's price was hovering around 24 bucks. What happened? Well, it reached 70 dollars in mid 2007, so you know they were they were on track, but then the wheels fell off the bubble in the housing crisis and the resulting bonds that were tied to the mortgages of the houses that were sold without any documentation, the liar loans started to fall. The dominoes started to fall. And the price started falling as the credit markets re started reacting to the home mortgage crisis. Well, folks, McGraw-Hill owned at the time, not anymore, but, but they owned Standard & Poor's, and Standard & Poor's was one of the companies that was saying, no problem, don't worry about all these mortgages, they're triple A rated, you goofballs. <laughs> right, they were, resp and you know, they, they looked like idiots, they really did look bad, and they, they took their beating on Capitol Hill, and nothing changed, of course, but they had to, they had to be publicly humiliated, and the price plummeted as the home mortgage loan crisis spread to the entire financial sector in 2008. And their mid-2007 prediction was even uglier. <laughs> right, because it, 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 to mid-2007 was just as things started to look bad, folks. It was just, it was just a just the beginning when we started to realize we is in a whole lot of trouble <laughs> yeah right um <clears throat> they're mid 2000s yes but what about the the uh the third edition what about the third edition folks let's take a look at the third edition well we have to be careful because this this is before they split but in 2003, they, it was $54.49, and they were expecting it to go up to 90 to 110 And sure enough, folks, they were right on the money. The value line predicted that the price of McGraw-Hill would be, a, be around 90 to 110 That's because it was, you know, they split the stock in the subsequent times. And sure enough, they reached $120, $60 split adjusted, you know, divide by two. By the end of 2006, they were right on the money. Now, I get a kick when some investors trash the value line. They they call them fuddy-duddies and old-fashioned. Well, look, they make mistakes, too, just like everybody else. But I would sure love to see how their investors' long-term results stack up against the long-term results of value line. Hmm? Who do you think would have the better results? Plus, they don't only do those... Um, individual stock sheets they also have model portfolios that they create showing you if you're you know a very high risk investor and if you're a very low risk investor and moderate and you know you don't have to use their uh, choices but you get the idea of what they believe uh, you know somebody who's prudent long-term investor who doesn't want too much volatility would invest in and somebody who's actively trying to to pop the lights out, you know, to pop, shoot the eye-popping returns. And they also have their commentaries at length about the economy and the general state of the, uh, the, company, the country and, and the like. And they're great reading. I was going there almost every week in late 2008 
And sure enough, they were doing the they they were they were having the same feelings that that everybody else was feeling. You know, we we don't think it's going to be so bad. You know, we're in for a rough time because that's what I was thinking. I was thinking we're going to go down twenty twenty five percent. It doesn't it doesn't look that bad. I mean, there's not too many mortgages are going to go. Uh, it's looking really not so good. You know, things are actually not that great. This is looking really bad, folks. It we're <laughs> they, you can just you can just see them going through the same emotional angst that everybody else was going through, but of course they're value line, so they're supposed to look respectable. They were just as scared as everybody else. <laughs> yeah, right. Slide fifty five. Okay, now this is something I finally included in the presentation as a slide because a couple of years ago I didn't have this. And people would come up to me and say, well, you don't really believe all this stuff, do you? And I said, well, did, did you listen to the presentation? Oh, no, I just looked at the power. Well, okay, okay. I got to put it in here because at the very end, I give you the, the bottom line. And here it is, folks. Once we have finished all our valuation calculations, what should we do? Should we really pray, place much value in our predictions, our precise calculations? The answer is emphatically is no 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 <laughs> rather we should a hurl them into the vast ocean along with the ashes of our dead pets and relatives b shred them into millions of little pieces of paper and use them as confetti at our next party or c burn them in a huge bonfire as we dance naked under the full moon and then you can come up with your own ways of destroying them uh, creatively. We do these calculations to simply tilt the odds in our favor. Instead of placing any significance in these predictions, after we have finished, we should ignore them and ask ourselves a very simple question. Do I really want to own this company? Do I really want to own 3M? Do I want to partner with them? Yeah. Do I want to own FedEx or Nike or GE? Does it fit well into my risk versus reward tolerance? Is it a good, prudent, long-term company that offers a decent return with relative safety of principle? Or is it speculative? You understand? Warren Buffett says it like this. If you would want to own the entire company, if you would want to own FedEx, be in charge of FedEx, be the CEO and have it as your family business, great, buy 10 shares or 100 shares or however many you can afford and hold on to them. Uh, you know, that's, that, yeah, that's what I think. If you want to be speculative, go right ahead. Good luck. But I think you'll do better over the long term and give yourself fewer ulcers if you simply buy good long-term companies with histories of long histories of raising dividends and sit on them. End of soapbox. And that's the end of chapter six and our common stock valuation. Now I want you to go back and do these problems over and over and over again until you are thoroughly immersed, soaked in the, uh, the <clears throat> dividend discount models. Okay? Because we're ready to take a look at um, financial statements. And they sort of played around with this. Uh, they call it projecting cash flow and earnings. I call it ratio analysis. We're looking at financial statements in the next chapter 17. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent effort and attention and realize that you now have some tools that I believe, as I've said many times, will tilt the odds in your favor and make you a very happy, well-rewarded, long-term stock investor. See ya!